Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Very excited to see you all here, a sign of the importance of the subject, the initiative. Uh, here we are during reading period in a full house, so testament to Jared Cohen, who will be talking about the New World Order. As you know, Jared is the founder and president of Jigsaw, a technology incubator at Alphabet, previously known as Google Ideas. He also serves as a senior advisor to Alphabet's executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, and a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he was a uh, member of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's policy planning staff, and indeed a close advisor to both Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. He's the author, I think, now of four books, including a forthcoming book uh, called The Accidental Presidents, uh, including, I think, a very important first uh, book, The New Digital Age, Transforming Nations, Business, and Our Lives, which he co-authored with Eric Schmidt. He's written very widely, including uh, recently in Foreign Affairs, Waging a Digital Counterinsurgency Against ISIS, and a very interesting new uh, essay uh, with uh, Bill Burns in Foreign Policy. He has a BA from Stanford, an MPhil uh, from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and his resume says he's fluent in Swahili, but he will not be using it today, I understand. <laughs> Delighted to have you with us. Uh, he'll speak for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then we'll have a brief conversation and open it up to you. Thank you for being with us, and Jared, thank you so much right, for being here. <laughs> with a quote from my favorite obscure American inventor who once lied and said he invented the air conditioner, which it turns out he did not. Uh, but he once said that we should all be concerned about the future because we're going to have to spend the rest of our lives there. Now, I like this quote for, for two reasons. One, despite all of the processing power that we have, despite all the analytical capability that we have, the pace of innovation is such that it's getting harder and harder to predict what's going to happen in the future. And historically, every generation could maybe at best experience one seismically changing innovation that would define generations to come. We in the sort of tech world you know, generally believe that anybody who thinks they can predict the future uh, technologically more than five to seven years out is probably better suited as a science fiction writer than a computer scientist. Uh, but the other is you know, we, we split our times between a physical and a digital world. Um, and while at some point we're all going to physically die, our identities will live forever um, and be subject to whatever scrutiny data permanence uh, allows them to be. Um, but before we talk about where we're going, I think it's always useful to reflect on where we came from and where we are today. So if we look at the last decade and a half, which has basically been the life cycle of Google to date, um, it's really been a story about the advent of technology. It's been a story about the access revolution. And it's quite interesting because we're basically getting ready to close the book on this chapter of history. It was not obvious that we would be able to build devices cheap enough, fast enough, and get the technological infrastructure built sufficiently around the world that as recently as December I could be in the tribal areas of Pakistan and have better 4G access than I have in East Hampton. Um, right? like that's sort of interesting and, and surprising. Uh, but what does this sort of story of the access revolution and the technological revolution look like? Well, since the year 2000, we've gone from 361 million people connected to the internet to now roughly four and a half billion people. Um, since that same time period, we've gone from about 907 million mobile devices in circulation to now roughly 7.2 billion mobile devices in circulation. Of those mobile devices, only 2.6 billion of them are smart devices that connect to the internet. Um, so we have a long way to go, at least statistically. Um, but what's also interesting is you put this in context, right? So India, a country of 1.2 billion people, has more mobile devices than it does outhouses in the entire country. Um, there's 3 billion more mobile devices in the world than there are toothbrushes in circulation around the world, which I find utterly bizarre as somebody who cares about my dental hygiene. Now, with this access, revolution has also come a revolution in content. 
Um, I think the story of video really illustrates this. So we now have 350 hours of YouTube footage uploaded every single minute. Uh, we have four billion videos that are viewed every single hour. And we have six billion hours of footage uploaded every single month. So we actually had consultants do a study and they determined that it would take Hollywood 43,000 years to develop the same amount of content that's uploaded to YouTube in a single year, right? Google's photographed more than five million miles of roads. That's enough to go to the moon 10 times and back and so forth. So I could kind of go on and on with these facts and figures, but I think you get the point. Um, you know, the, the punchline with, with, with all of this is while we marvel at the pace and speed of all of this access, um, the real innovation here, the real story of the access revolution is why all of this matters. Um, so I know Eric is coming here on Friday and you'll hear a bit from him. He and I have traveled to probably more than 40 countries, um, really strange countries. Um, you know, we've been to North Korea together, but we've never been to South Korea together. We've gone to, you know, all over the Middle East, all over South Asia, and really tried to ask these questions of, as technology arrives in your country, um, what is the impact it's having on your society? Um, and by show of hands, how many of you just in general find it difficult to imagine living your life without your phone? Right, everybody. How many of you would be five minutes late for class if you left your phone in the coffee shop and wanted to go back and get it? Right, so, um, how many of you, if your phone was sitting uh, in the middle of the West Side Highway with cars speeding by, would run out onto the highway and go grab the phone? And just to be sort of provocative and obnoxious, why don't I give you a 50% chance of survival and a 25% chance of like losing a leg? How many of you would still do it? I hear Columbia has a great psychology department. We can sort of make a connection for you later. Um, you know, I, ask, I, I make this point because look, we, 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 we sort of marvel at all the technology. We find it difficult to imagine living, with it, living without it. At the end of the day, we're not really gonna risk our lives for it. Um, but one of the things that Eric and I found, um, you know, before we went to North Korea and after, we spent a lot of time with North Korean defectors. And when you're there, it's sort of a dog and pony show. Um, and the only thing interesting is when they show you how their 3G network works and when they show you how their wireless network works and, and so forth. And if somebody remembers during the Q&A part to ask me, I'll tell you a really funny story about North Korea that has nothing to do with my talk, but is, you know, sort of endlessly hilarious. Um, but, 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 I'm sorry? I thought you had a question. Uh, so North Korea, a country, 24 million people. Um, the punishment for being caught with a smuggled mobile device, in some cases, carries the death penalty for three generations of your family. And yet, we've heard from defectors that literally thousands of North Koreans in the country risk their lives to access smuggled smart devices and then risk their lives again to come near the Chinese border to be able to get a signal. Uh, when we were in Libya, we heard about Libyan schoolgirls who used Google Maps to crowdsource where the bombs were falling and where the violence was so they could find safe passageway to school. You know, it's sort of really, you, know, you think about Google Maps as a way to get from point A to point B. You don't think of it as a way for young schoolgirls to, you know, be able to continue going to school in the middle of a war. Um, when I went to college, I thought I wanted to be an anthropologist. And there's this village that I sort of lived in in the summer in between, the summer of 2001. Um, and there was no running water, no electricity, no infrastructure. It took forever to get there. It was in southwestern Kenya. Um, and I stayed with a man named Mzeole Saidimu, who had three wives and 41 children. It's a fascinating character. Um, and spent all day sort of herding goats and sheep and so forth. Um, and I visited the village probably five or six times since then. Um, funny story about this. Last time I went, I arrived by helicopter. And the only thing they knew about helicopters was that the president of Kenya had them. So they asked me if I was now the president of Kenya. Uh, I felt very good about myself. Um, but it was interesting. There's still, you know, even as recently as three years ago, there's no running, still no running water, still no electricity, still no infrastructure. And yet all of the women, the Maasai women, have these beaded pouches around their neck with a mobile device in it. And all the men right next to their sword um, have another pouch for their mobile device. And so you wonder, like, what are they doing with these? Well, you know, they no longer have to guess which market to walk 10 kilometers to. They now just call their friend. Um, you know, and the women, you know, even though it's a cashless society, are using a Kenyan-based mobile money transfer program to be able to sell their beaded jewelry to each other. Now, the question I had was, how do you charge the phones? Which I thought was like sort of a silly question. Turns out it's a very interesting question through no sort of innovative um, uh, 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 sort of capacity of mine. Um, Every Tuesday on market day, um, people bring their phones to the market, and there's these kids who take USAID food relief bags and fill up the bags with the phones. They spend an entire day going from the village to Nairobi, 
and then they spend an entire day the following day with surge protectors sitting in hotel lobbies charging the phones until they get kicked out. Um, and then they come back to the village and they sort of give everybody their charged phone. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But when you, you know, we've all sort of, you know, been to different parts of the world and you marvel how you give a kid your old sneakers and they come back brand new or you, you know, you know people just sort of do more with less. It's the same thing with technology, right? So the technology may still be built in a lot of developed economies, but the creative uses of that technology will be developed by the places where you know, innovation is driven most by necessity. So I find that I've learned more about technology that I thought I understood by traveling to really sort of complicated, rough, and impoverished parts of the world, um, just because people use that technology with a far greater efficiency. Um, that same mobile money uh, transfer program that I mentioned is also now being used in Afghanistan to address police absenteeism, a problem that the U.S. government was trying to deal with for a very long time. It turned out that Safaricom, the, one of the main uh, uh, telecommunications operators in Kenya, was able to do something that all the governments couldn't, which is to scale their mobile money transfer program so that the Afghan National Police could uh, uh, essentially receive their salaries on time in their entirety and send them via mobile money transfer to their families rather than having to get a sack of cash which was missing a bunch of money, abandon their post for two weeks, travel somewhere, and then come back. And because the Afghan National Police are largely illiterate, they implemented a voice activation software where now all they need to know is the number one, two, or three. And then probably the, the most chilling example is um, yeah, I've spent a bit of time in Pakistan, and I remember not my last trip to Pakistan, but the one before that, I met a group of women who'd been attacked by the Taliban with acid, um, and through no fault of their own, the physical scars that they bear, they carry this terrible stigma in society, right? It prevents them from you know, not being able to get jobs, they can't get married, um, you know, of course all the blame is assigned on them, and so forth. So I go to visit these women, they're in a house together in, in Lahore, and they were so cheery and jubilant when I walked in, and I asked one of them, given what's happened, how do you maintain your resolve? I mean, I, you know, I, don't, I would sort of be beside myself. Um, and she held up her phone and she said, you know, with access to the internet online, my scars are invisible, so the internet has given me a second chance at life. It's such an obvious thing when you hear it, um, but it's not something that we necessarily think about because we can all sort of walk freely around the world. So we don't think about these sort of populations that are cast aside and what the internet can do for them. So, you know, all of this is like very optimistic and exciting and so forth, and I think that this is a very important piece of what that access revolution has been, which is a story of access and a story of access mattering um, in ways that are really surprising to all of us. But if the story of the last decade and a half has been about the advent of technology, you know, the question is what does the next decade plus look like? Um, so the key statistic here is, remember I said there were 2.6 billion smartphones in circulation today. By 2020, that number is going to be closer to 7.1 billion. Um, and that doesn't even do, take into account the Internet of Things and tablets and, and, and so forth. So what you include is basically everybody, for the most part, is going to have access. So the next decade plus is really going to be defined by the ubiquity of technology, right? This ubiquitous moment where data exists and is being mass produced in every corner of the world. Um, and what does all of that mean for society? And it's impossible to talk about the ubiquity of technology without talking about data. And it's impossible to talk about data without talking about the power of what machines can do. And in particular, I want to talk about artificial intelligence, more specifically machine learning, and how I think that's really going to define our next generation. So when Eric and I wrote The New Digital Age, we observed that in the future, human beings and computers will split duties according to what they're both good at. Right? Human beings are very good at judgment and sensibility in these needle in a haystack problems. Computers, uh, or sorry, uh, judgment and sensibility, computers are very good at these needle in a haystack problems. And I think what we found is we we're actually wrong about this. Um, that the advent of big data and even bigger data, coupled with the ability to process that data through multiple machines, allowed us to build not just neural nets, but deep neural nets that uh, made it possible to use machine learning to tackle far more complex human challenges, and those things that we thought humans could do that machines would never be able to do, we're finding that the equation is tipping massively in favor of machines. Now, whether you want the machine to annex all of your human capabilities is a personal decision. I'm just talking about what the technology is capable of. And we sort of marvel at what we've seen already, right? So you can imagine, you know, right now it's already possible for, you know, a native Arabic speaker in, say, Morocco with a very distinct accent to be able to have a conversation with somebody in rural China 
where they don't speak each other's language and have the translation repeated back in an accent and language of their choosing. Right? So you can imagine somebody just deciding they want everything to be translated in their wife's voice or their husband's voice or maybe a grandparent who's passed away in their voice. So they're sort of, you know, all the translation is grandpa. Um, you know, this is possible today. Um, our ability to read lips with near perfect precision is possible today. Um, you know, one of the alphabet companies, DeepMind, recently built an AI that they deployed to beat the world's greatest Go player of all time, a problem that artificial intelligence experts said was, you know, w was never going to be possible. And even as recently as two weeks ago, um, you know, Google released a uh, new feature of Google Translate where you can literally take a picture, uh, you can hold up your phone and take a picture of any image, and if that image has text on it, the machine can detect which part of the image is text, siphon it off, translate it into any one of 40 plus languages that you want it translated into, superimpose it back onto the image in that language, and return the image with the text to you. So you know, each year you're going to sort of like marvel at more and more of these things. But the, the real sort of um, you know, change that's going to come in AI that's going to be a real game changer is what I call inventive AI. Um, and this is when you train a machine on a particular data set and then the machine is able to tackle a broader range of challenges. So if you're running a business, what this looks like is, you know, you imagine giving a computer a bunch of unstructured data. Um, it learns on that unstructured data, let's say spreadsheets used to manage business records. And then that machine just becomes your sort of dynamic business operations, you know, management consultant and you come to work as a CEO and it tells you to reorg the finance department and how to do it without being asked. Right, so we're moving from treating our machines as assistants to having this dynamic relationship with our machines where they're proactively um, guiding us and giving us advice. Again, you may not want this, uh, but the technology is, is bringing us there. So again, all of this sounds really exciting, right? All of this you know, sounds super inspiring, maybe a little bit scary. Um, but what does it all mean geopolitically? Well, I mentioned that you know, we're sort of you know, entering into this era where you know, technology is, 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 is ubiquitous in every corner of the globe. So it does impact every single country in a way that they will want to harness it. So how do it starts with power and the recalibration of power. So today we think about how powerful a country is by virtue of what is its economic, political, and military might. That is still the case today, even in this ubiquitous moment. Um, we just answer it a little bit differently, which is the most powerful countries are the ones that are going to be able to project that economic, political, and military influence in a world that's more hybrid. So what does this mean for the current players on the scene? You have incumbents like the United States and China that just get even more powerful, right? You know, they, they, they already have a huge advantage in the physical realm. Um, they're able to carry that advantage into the digital realm as well. Um, you get small countries that are able to punch way above their weight that I would put in the friendly category. Uh, Israel, Singapore, you know, these are countries that get disproportionately stronger relative to their physical influence because of their unique cyber capabilities. Then you get some adversarial countries like North Korea and Iran, which were politically pariahs, economically strangled by sanctions, um, and militarily stuck with spare parts uh, that they can't get for their sort of various you know, military adventures. In a world where technology is ubiquitous, the combination of their norms and low barriers of entry for nefarious cyber activity have made North Korea and Iran win the most improved award uh, in terms of geopolitical power. And then you get countries like Russia, which absent the ubiquity of technology is a declining power, declining birth rates, not getting much of a return on natural resources. You know, yes, they can do adventures in South Abkhazia um, and annex Crimea, but in terms of a global military reach, the Cold War is over. Um, but enter the ubiquity of technology, and all of a sudden, you know, if you look at all the things that Russia is doing today, none of it's new. Um, they're just doing it in new topography and with new tools, but it's the same Cold War motivations um, and drivers that they've been able to tap into and resurrect in this new hybrid moment. Um, and I would point out that I don't think there's such thing as cyberspace. You know, to me, there's just one international system, and it has a physical front, and it has a digital front. Um, you know, the international system is still made up of states, um, and those states will sort of behave with each other in a more multi-dimensional way. Um, so let's sort of talk about, um, you know, uh, let's go back to the data conversation and mix it with um, my observations about power. So to me, data is the digital equivalent of oil, right? If you think about it, it fuels economies, it shapes geopolitics, it influences societies both for good and for ill. It's collection, it's refinement, it's distribution, it involves some of the most complex 
systems ever built by humans. Um, but there's a handful of uh, things that I think make data quite different. First, um, it's the largest man-made resource the world will ever know as opposed to a natural resource. Two, um, you know, it's not sort of um, curbed by geography, right? So in the case of oil and natural resources, geography is destiny. You either have it or you don't have it. And if you have it, you either have the ability to extract it or you don't. Um, here you have 196 countries that are mass producing it with every single citizen being its own metaphorical oil well. Um, you also have very few economic barriers of entry. Um, right? it's, it's incredibly cheap to be involved in owning, developing, and disseminating content without having to rely on intermediaries. But you know, I can sort of go on and on with the analogy, but the, 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 the main point here is that just like with oil and natural resources, um, countries will pursue them, you know, countries pursue those natural resources with a voracious appetite to try to get an advantage in, in, in the world. Um, we should expect that they're going to do the same thing with data, right? So when there's such an abundance of data and that data is going to define who's capable and who's not capable in the future, that data is going to determine, you know, who's able to buttress their physical capabilities with massive AI and digital capabilities, um, then I think there is a very sort of cautious warning to, to observe, which is that, you know, in the case of oil and gas and natural resources, you have you know, some countries that got it right. You know, Norway had a very good experience with how it's managed its natural resources. And you have a very long list of countries that got it terribly wrong. Venezuela, you know, Iran, um, you know, Nigeria is another example. You, you just countries have just mismanaged this resource, you know, due to corruption or nefarious motivations and, and, and so forth. Um, but like oil and gas and natural resources, um, I think we should also assume that data will have a wartime utility. Um, and I think this is sort of one of the least understood aspects of the new chapter of geopolitics that, you know, is, is a direct result of technology now being ubiquitous. So my view is that, you know, we thought that we were seeing an era where wars were declining. Um, and the ubiquity of technology now means that all wars will begin as cyber wars. And more often than not, they're not going to spill over into the physical domain. So when I say all wars will begin as cyber wars, what I mean is it's you know, simply too appealing for states not to you know, engage in you know, these wars that unfold silently, invisibly, and relatively inexpensively. Um, and right now, we're in this perpetual state of, I would say, cyber skirmishes, where you have cyber skirmishes happening, and every single country is involved in it. You know, it's even time to call into question whether or not democracies will go to war with each other again. Um, depending on how you define, you know, the distinction between a cyber skirmish and a cyber war. Um, you know, we'll see a number of countries get back into the state-sponsored terrorism game because it's, you know, again, the barriers of entry are much lower in terms of who's willing to pull the trigger uh, on the cyber front relative to the physical front. So you'll see heightened frequency um, in nefarious activity between states, and I think the real sort of shift is you know, we had typically thought of cyber war as the hacking of systems and infrastructure. What's new is we're really seeing the marriage of that sort of traditional hacking with attempts to hack the conversation and the discourse. Um, and I want to talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. But before I do that, um, you, know, you have a number of countries that will have a unique ability to harness the power of technology to engage in these wars in various ways. So the question is, how do the weaker survive? What do the weaker do? Well, I believe that cyberspace is the world's largest ungoverned space, um, and the attributes of an ungoverned space or a, or a failed state or a collapsed society is that you often have entrepreneurs, criminals, warlords, and other sort of awful characters um, who profit off of the lack of order. And it's the same thing in the cyber domain, right? We'll see you know, cyber arms merchants, we'll see um, you know, criminals essentially have no scruples about selling the capabilities to states that want to buy it, and we'll certainly see the more powerful states, you know, engage in the equivalent of natural resources for cyber arms deals. Um, so the capabilities will be sort of spread throughout um, and shared throughout. We'll see the laundering of that capability. Um, even it'll, it'll impact terrorist organizations as well. So if you look at ISIS, you know, everyone loves to talk about the tech savvy of, of ISIS. I'd rather talk about their sort of marketing savvy. Um, there's no evidence that ISIS possesses the technical capability to conduct the type of cyber attack um, that you would put in the category of a terrorist attack, right? They're good at propaganda, they're good at recruitment, they're good at logistics, but they're not good at cyber attacks. So if we assume that every terrorist organization in the future 
will have the marketing capability of ISIS just by virtue of the age demographic of its members. We should also assume that ISIS's successor, or perhaps ISIS itself, will just go out and buy the capability on the black market. Um, you know, even if you look at a place like Nigeria, you have the best 419 scammers in the world. I've met many of them. Um, and you have one of the worst terrorist organizations, Boko Haram. Um, from the conversations I've had with some of these criminals, they're not like the most moral people. Um, they don't have the most integrity. Um, you know, what they care about is money. Um, and throw an intermediary in there who obfuscates the sort of person or the organization purchasing the capability, and it's not a hard leap to imagine um, that type of collaboration. Um, so then the question is, you know, before I get into the specifics, if you're the U.S. government, how might you manage this? What might you do about? Uh, what might you do about this? Well, as it pertains to attacks in the cyber domain, your defenses are only as good as your machine learning models are able to detect an attack before it happens and patch your software before um, the vulnerability is, is, is exploited. Um, and a machine learning model is only as good as the data set, how annotated that data set is, and again, how sophisticated uh, the machine learning models are. So the US actually has very good machine learning models. We certainly have very good machine learning capability in the private sector. My proposal is maybe it's time to reevaluate how we think about military assistance. So you can imagine a whole series of renegotiated deals with NATO allies, um, as well as others, where you essentially say to them, we will give you our machine learning models um, to protect you in the cyber domain in exchange for, we want full and unfettered access to all of the training data that comes with the attack. So imagine this, right now, you sell a bunch of F-18s to Pakistan and there's some indirect narrative around you know, how that protects the homeland here in the United States. But you provide machine learning models to Ukraine or to Estonia, and every time those countries get attacked, um, it hits the machine learning models and our own cyber defenses will get stronger at home. So I mentioned the sort of hacking of the conversation, um, and I want to start with the first example of this, which I call patriotic trolling. Um, you know, this is when cyberbullying becomes better organized, better funded, and state-sponsored. Um, it's the digital equivalent of taking out key influencers off the battlefield. So in the case of Turkey, Erdogan is right now um, uh, using a combination of real trolls and botnets, um, you know, which are basically a bunch of exploited um, uh, you know, computers that are involved in the trolling effort um, and fully compromised to uh, hit female journalists with dozens of rape threats every single minute. Um, you know, in Thailand, you speak out against the king, and there's these sort of massive efforts at universities to force people to, you know, drop out of school and convince them that everybody has turned against them. Um, and it's incredibly effective. It, it's not physical assassination, but it's character assassination. And we certainly have heard many examples of um, an attack on an individual starting off as patriotic trolling and ending in a physical assassination attempt. Now, the second example is what I call a digital insurgency. Um, now, it's interesting. People love to talk about how the Russians hacked the U.S. election. Um, and they, I don't think people quite understand. You know, people talk about fake news in one category, or they talk about hacking of the voting machines and so forth. Um, the real way that we're seeing elections get hacked is the carefully curated um, um, and sort of mass-produced army of cultivated identities um, coupled with botnets that supplement those identities that look and sound just like all of you with a variety of views. So you've got Bernie Sanders supporters, Trump supporters. They've manipulated, they've created Black Lives Matter accounts. Um, they've created Planned Parenthood accounts. And they start off just participating in the conversation as if they're one of us. Um, and then they slowly start to try to shift the conversation. Um, so the interesting thing here is as they're sort of cultivated and developed, they all follow each other, and then all the botnets follow each other, and as a result, you get these influential curated accounts operating outside of you know, St. Petersburg that have hundreds of thousands of followers. So by society standards, they have the status of being influential. So this is, again, this is the digital equivalent of deploying like, you know, sort of soldiers to you know, fight a proxy battle in the middle of our election. And it's not a particularly difficult uh, technological exercise to do, and certainly Russia is not the only country doing it. We see, by the way, it happening even in more democratic countries. But you know, you, you sort of heard that narrative during the election of Bernie Sanders supporters hate Hillary Clinton so much that they're flipping their support to Donald Trump. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not, but that's an example of the type of narrative you could imagine them wanting to create with some of these digital soldiers. Or you sort of ask yourself the question, why on earth would they be creating you know, Black Lives Matter accounts? 
Well, their goal is chaos, right? Their goal is not necessarily to you know, sort of flip an election one way or the other. That's too difficult. They just want instability, and in a zero-sum world, chaos equals a win. So you can imagine them you know, looking at, okay, what are the debates in the US that don't have a racial component? You know, Planned Parenthood. You know, it's you know, male and female. It's Democrat and Republican. Um, you know, it's pro-life, pro-choice. There's sort of all sorts of, of sort of stereotypical sides that you can pit against each other as part of the Planned Parenthood debate. But they would look at it and they would say, there's no racial component to it. So maybe we can create a racial component to it by cultivating some of these identities, inserting them into the conversation, and seeing if we can stoke um, you know, the flame of something that has a kernel of truth to it. Right? They, they, they look for demonstrations that are already happening. They look for debates that are already uh, trending. And then they join the conversation. Um, and then fake news, which I think, in some respects, gets more gets so much attention that it obfuscates uh, some of these other tactics. Um, yes, fake news is a problem. Um, but to me, it's the sort of digital equivalent of old analog information wars. Um, and yes, some people are influenced by it. I think part of the problem is we don't have a uniform definition of what fake news is. If I asked all of you, you would give me a different answer. Uh, my biggest concern is fake news being used as a weapon of war which it was used as during the Rwanda genocide, which it was used as uh, to build the case to go to war with Spain in the early 1900s. This is sort of a well-practiced art. Um, and you, know, you could imagine lots of situations where a country says, you know, a country is looking to go to war, and rather than wait to be attacked, it just convinces its population it was attacked. So you can imagine an intifada happening based on an attack that never happened. Right? You could imagine a country going to war um, and a population getting fully behind it um, having no idea that they've just been the recipients of a fake news blitzkrieg. Or you can imagine a country you know, you know, using fake news to kind of digitally wag the dog, if you remember, to distract from a foreign adventure that's not going well or to distract from something domestically that's not going well. And then the last point that I'll make is um, you know, where this leaves us right now, um, which is there are no rules that govern how states engage with each other in this. And it's hard enough to understand international law in the physical context, let alone in the digital context. But there's no doctrine of proportional response for the cyber domain. And as a result, there's no deterrence in the cyber domain. So there's been experiments with this, right? You kick out some Russian diplomats. You indict some Iranian hackers. Um, you, know, you sort of slap new sanctions on North Korea. None of this is enough to create the digital equivalent of mutually assured destruction. Much of the counteractivity happens in the covert side of things. So if it's not known, um, then you can't sort of create that fear that leads to, uh, to deterrence. And I think that this is easier said than done. I think we need to draw on existing doctrinal thinking about proportional response, but understand that we're really looking at a mutation of it, not a carbon copy of it, right? Because you know, attribution is extremely difficult in the cyber domain, right? You can imagine you know, uh, two countries going to war over an attribution mistake where it was actually another country. And you know, countries and criminals would be heavily incentivized to pin it on somebody else. We don't really understand the second and third order effects. You don't have the equivalent of the red phone with the hotline. Um, we don't really understand the legal framework associated with this. Um, it gets very complicated in terms of public and private sector. Um, and there just aren't a lot of precedents. Um, and Somebody needs to start setting these rules or countries that we don't really like very much are going to be the ones establishing these doctrines and we're going to find ourselves stuck with them. And I think perhaps the most difficult aspect of this is, has to do with how we think about retaliation. Um, so let me give you a little thought experiment. Imagine uh, that we sort of, you know, so Fidel Castro is now dead. Imagine that we woke up tomorrow and learned that Fidel Castro had actually irrefutably been responsible for JFK's assassination. You know, this is now 50 plus years later. You know, we've, you, know, you know, there's a long way to go with Cuba, but things are presumably trending in the right direction. Um, what would you do? You know, because the brother is still the president and was part of that regime. And that regime that is, you know, still has elements running the country was responsible for the assassination of a sitting president, but it's been like 50 years and people have kind of moved on and nobody wants to sort of go back to that and this and that. Like, do you go to war with Cuba in this era, in this context? I, I, don't, I don't think so, right? So that delayed retaliatory moment where you find out way after the fact who was responsible and what they did and context and emotion and politics all change is the experience that we will almost always have as it pertains to cyber attacks, right? So you will not, so let's look at the French election. 
you know, you know, I assume Macron will win, maybe, maybe not. Um, let's assume that two years into his presidency, um, he receives, you know, irrefutable evidence that Russia hacked the French election and tried to tip it towards Marine Le Pen. Let's just, for purposes of argument, say that that happens and that there's no, you know, daylight between the intelligence and reality. But let's also assume that, you know, he's managed to really patch things up with Russia. They figured out, you know, a, a sort of way forward on Ukraine. Everything's really positive. Um, and then he finds this out halfway through his term and he's sort of sitting in the equivalent of the situation room and you're sort of faced with this question, what do we do in response? And that response feels like it's totally out of context because everything has changed. So this is the most difficult aspect of proportional response to deal with in the cyber domain. And then finally, what this means for all of you is um, there's a reason why your security in your sort of day-to-day -day activities online is more and more of a problem. It's because if you are online, you're living in a digital war zone, and as states are going to war with each other and skirmishing with each other in every corner of the globe, you're all basically getting hit with the digital equivalent of shrapnel. Um, so you have to think about your cybersecurity as you would if you were sort of walking into an unsafe place. You know, like wear your flak jacket, wear your helmet. You know, these are all sort of metaphors for things like two-factor authentication and not having the same password for everything and, um, you know, and sort of taking the necessary precautions. But I think my larger macro level caution or warning is that if we don't get this right, I believe that we are trending towards an experience where we might find ourselves in a sort of uh, the digital equivalent of a Guns of August moment, where two countries that have no business going to war with each other end up finding themselves with so much momentum in that direction that they can't control. And that is the collision course that we're on right now. And I think it's up to students like all of you to figure out what the heck we do about it. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much. Well, let me ask you a couple questions um, uh, in general, and then uh, perhaps one about Alphabet, and then open it up. You know, we're doing a conference uh, this Friday on fragmentation and globalization. I'm very pleased that Eric Schmidt will be joining us. And, and that's really capturing, I think, some of the themes you've identified. That on the one hand, there's this uh, ubiquity of interconnection. It's creating tremendous opportunities for all sorts of people, bringing uh, the developing world uh, in small, medium-sized businesses, um, uh, creating innovations and payment systems, et cetera, all sorts of wonderful things. At the same time, we've seen recently borders increase, not decrease. We've had a, a mindset of nationalism growing, I think, around the world. I think a decline of a, a kind of liberal, global mindset of uh, uh, creating systems that are for the benefit of the world instead of focus on my country, et cetera. So you have these cross pressures, I think, of globalization and then national policies aimed at fragmentation that also affects the internet. Mm -hmm. So in that world and the one you've described, you know, tech companies and policymakers, all of us need to be thinking, what can we do to increase trust in interconnection? And from your perspective, what do you think of as the things that can be done? I mean, I think companies are still too reactive. Um, you know, I think there's been uh, different chapters of this. I think in the early days of the modern internet, um, you know, it seemed like there were a bunch of geopolitical and international security issues that had nothing to do with what the companies were working on and focused on. And I think that was true when most of the world wasn't connected. But if you look at where the vast majority of future internet users are coming online, they are the most complex, internationally, you know, sort of conflict-ridden, uh, most censored parts of the world. So all of the baggage of the physical world will spill over into the digital world as these societies come, on, come online. There will not be, just as there, no war will, um, you know, just as every war will begin as a cyber war, there will be no challenge in the physical realm that doesn't have a digital manifestation uh, to it, right? So name your physical challenge. I will be able to tell you what I anticipate is the sort of digital equivalent of that. Um, but I also think that, you know, governments have a real dilemma. 
um, uh, in the sense that you know, if I asked all of you, you know, by show of hands, how many of you have multiple email accounts? How many would you? How many of you would raise your hand? And how many of you have multiple phone numbers? And how many of you have multiple social networking profiles? Right, so basically each of you is like one person with a giant virtual entourage and because you use these emails and numbers and accounts for different things, you also all have multiple personality disorder. So if you're, let's say you're the regime in Iran. Um, you have a population of 80 million physical people that all have a virtual entourage and all of a sudden you have a country that looks more like a billion people online and that's before you even take into, into account transnational meddlers who pretend they're Iranian. Um, same thing in a democracy. So everyone wants to talk about you know, the rise of populism right now and so forth and I think we should be talking about whether or not the mirage of populism is as much of a problem as what we're seeing which is I, I think part of the issue is you hear about these sort of populist surges and people aren't answering landlines to take polls anymore and we already know in Europe polling doesn't really work that well anymore. Maybe we'll sort of recalibrate this after the French election but in the UK it certainly you know, um, uh, didn't match everybody's expectations. And so in an era where traditional methodologies for predicting outcomes don't work, what you're left with is to study what's happening on the internet. Um, and as we've discussed in the presentation, it's quite easy to create a mirage. Um, you know, sort of and add all the different aspects of this that are sort of making it harder to detect the signal from the noise. And you're left wondering, you know, whether you're talking about a populist movement or a revolution, you know, it becomes much clearer that it's easier to start a movement or it's easier to start a revolution, it's harder to finish one. Um, and that it's easy online to get a lot of people to agree um, to be against something. Um, but literally rebuilding something um, requires real leadership. And my concern is that the accelerated pace of movement making is actually slowing down leadership development. So if you look at great leaders in the world, you know, Nelson Mandela, Charles de Gaulle, Lech Walesa, there's many others, all of them began their careers as leaders went through the trials and tribulations of being leaders before they ever became public figures. We will never see another leader that doesn't first begin as a flash in a pan internet celebrity that you know, maybe gets backfilled with leadership skills in the future. So there are sort of corners of the globe that aren't that connected yet where you still see some of these very colorful you know, uh, dissident voices and revolutionary voices, but I think our endowment of good leaders in the world is draining very quickly and not being refurbished. Um, Eric and I met with Pope Francis uh, about a year ago um, and it was wonderful, he was inspiring. Um, he's maybe the counter example to this but I also think there's a real question about after he's not Pope anymore whether the Vatican continues going in that direction or whether they sort of recalibrate to move in a different direction. So there's just like, if you look around the world it's probably the weakest collection of leaders per country. Um, that we've ever seen in history. And you have to ask yourself, like, why? Um, and I don't have a good answer to that, but I think that's a huge part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that's a good agenda to think about, you know, what is the trust, what can in improve trust. But let me, maybe a segue to that is also about norms. You spoke about, I think, um, you know, it's often said last year was the year of cyber norms. We had groups all over the world starting to think about this question and come up with different frameworks. And of course, the US and China agreed on a cyber uh, agreement of sorts uh, that, that says that, um, you know, they will not use uh, cyber hacking for, for uh, commercial espionage, just for state-to-state uh, -state issues, not for commercial. And, and, uh, and, and I think we, we got somewhere because the U.S. government was naming and shaming those uh, jurisdictions that were engaging in conduct that we thought was mm -hmm. reprehensible. Um, so I guess as you think about the establishment of norms, um, how would you address that as a, as a problem? I think it's a great question. I think that what, what's complicated about a multidimensional world is um, norms are no longer monolithic. Uh, even within a particular state. So you, let's look at even the United States and China, right? You know, the two, we've all, we're used to a set of norms, um, you know, uh, espoused by Beijing and we're used to a set of norms espoused by the United States um, and that makes sense in a world that's purely physical. Um, and you think about the physical relationship between the two countries, you know, they're either frenemies or, it's a complicated relationship but it functions. Um, and it functions, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a way that, that, that uh, maybe gives us some anxiety, but is certainly not feeling apocalyptic. Um, but then look at the 
foreign policy between the two countries in the cyber domain is more kinetic and warlike than the physical one between the US and North Korea, even in this very aggressive moment. So you ask yourself the question, what are the norms of the two countries when they seem to have two foreign policies for two different domains that contradict each other despite the fact that they're still only two countries? Um, so that's one complication. The second is, yeah, I think it's great the tech sector is beginning to think a lot more about ethics and norms and so forth. The problem is, um, you know, because of low barriers of entry, we should not, we can't take a sort of democratic society only approach to this because you can come up with a great, you know, sort of norm setting and ethics exercise, but that doesn't, there's a lot of autocratic countries out there that have, you know, very different norms that won't subscribe to a bunch of sort of people in democracies, you know, setting the standards. So we have to account, we have to account for that. Um, and then, um, I mean, think about how, think about where norms have manifested themselves in the international system, right? Around, you know, the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty or, you know, you, know, you, you, you have the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. You know, we can't even get that right, right? So, uh, you know, if you can't even implement norms around nuclear weapons, which nobody wants to use except maybe Kim Jong-un, um, if you can't even establish norms around those and get countries to behave and not cheat and not lie and not circumvent and you can't hold anyone accountable with inspectors and so forth, I, I'm, I'm nervous that this is going to be more difficult as it pertains to cyber norms by an order of magnitude. I think we have to try. Um, and, and I think we can make some progress, but I don't think you can have like the equivalent of the SALT agreements for cyberspace. Um, what I do think you can do, and this, I, th here's where I think you can have an impact with norms, is geography no longer needs to be the determinant of how we think about security cooperation. Um, and how we think about, you know, even, you know, you know, issues as diverse as climate and education and, you know, uh, politics and so forth. You know, you'll, on the negative side, you'll have like-minded states banding together to collectively edit the web. Right, and they'll engage in certain agreements. Like we won't, we'll, we'll, we'll filter out. Let, let's just agree. You know, if we're, you know, Turkey, and if we're China, let's just agree. Let's have a bilateral agreement that the internet in both of our countries won't say n anything nasty about either of our founders. Right, like you can imagine things like that. Um, but you could also imagine, um, you know, we, we have a huge opportunity for countries that previously didn't work together um, uh, because of geography uh, to work together because of a shared view of what you can do in cyberspace. And I think Estonia is a really interesting example of this because it's a country of 1.6 million people that's punching way above its physical weight, in part because until recently they had a computer scientist as a president, a uh, really remarkable um, individual. And Estonia, you know, like China has 50 municipalities that are larger than the entire country of Estonia, and yet Estonia was playing a very important advisory role to China around creating, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, you know electronic uh, uh, healthcare systems, uh, a, a role that Estonia would never be able to, to play in a world that was just physical. And we're, again, we're seeing this around cybersecurity as well. So I think our security cooperations and you know, how we think about um, uh, multilateral uh, treaties and, and, and organizations is an opportunity for norm setting. Yeah, thank you. Actually, President Ilves is a Columbia graduate yeah. and uh, was here just a, a few weeks ago talking to us about uh, uh, Russia election hacking and um, how commonplace this is. Uh, uh, let me ask you one last question, then I do want to, you know, you, you've created something extraordinary in Google Ideas Alphabet, and it, as I understand it, you, you know, you try to take on some really hard questions of problems in the world, whether it's um, an anti-ISIS initiative or pro-free speech or anti-bullying and many other examples. As you think about these really hard problems you want to take on, could you tell us what's been the most successful and how you think about success? Yeah, and it, it's been really, the, the, the restructuring of Google into Alphabet has been a really amazing opportunity for us. We were able to take Google Ideas and turn it into one of the Alphabet companies. We called it Jigsaw. Um, um, how we came up with the name, it, it's, it's actually quite interesting. We, we've probably had a list of 1,500 names. Um, none of which I liked. And then we were on vacation and my nanny was doing a jigsaw puzzle with my older daughter. And she's like, why don't you just call it Jigsaw? And Eric and I were like, oh, that's a really good name. Um, so we, uh, uh, um, but the, the, we have a very simple philosophy, which is, you know, we believe that technology should be making people around the world safer. 
and we are going to build technology um, that has complexity um, as well as commercial value that achieves that, that goal. So the way that we think about product development is every time I hire somebody, I send them out to a sort of strange part of the world um, that they haven't been to to talk to people about what gives them anxiety about the internet. So I have Patricia who runs business development for us in the front row. Patricia, where did I send you on your first day? So for those of you who didn't hear, Patricia, before even coming into the Jigsaw office in Chelsea, went to Iraq to interview incarcerated ISIS people um, to try to understand how they, uh, the impact that the internet had on their recruitment. Um, and, and, and that is a core to how we do things. So I'll give you a, so, so we send people into the field to understand how the internet is making security complicated for people. We are an engineering company, so that we then ask the question, is there a technology that we can build that has Google Alphabet jigsaw level complexity? Um, and then is there a way to, um, to, to scale that commercially? And commercially at our company is not necessarily about uh, monetization, it's about scale and advancing the technology. Um, so I would say, I'll give you one, um, a, a fun, easy, sort of low hanging fruit example, and then I'll answer your question about the most successful one to, to date. You know, we sent three engineers to Turkey to interview Syrian dissidents um, about what gave them anxiety about the internet. And they all said there's this thing called the Syrian Electronic Army. We don't know what it is, uh, but it scares the living daylights out of us. And we're terrified that we're going to accidentally give them our password. Um, and so uh, they came back and they said, let's build a technology where if you type your Gmail password anywhere other than where you're supposed to, it locks you out and forces you to change your password. So you essentially cannot get phished if you're a Gmail user. Um, and you have this technology. And the, they got really into all the sort of engineering complexity of it. And they built it with these, this, these Syrians in mind. And they were in touch with the Syrians every single day, um, iterating on the product with them. Um, and then they built it. They launched it. We then graduated it into Google. And now over a billion Gmail users um, have this anti-phishing tool, all because some engineers talked to some Syrian dissidents. That is how it is supposed to work. Right? You, know, you, know, it, it, you can call it altruism, or you can call it troubleshooting the worst case scenario first. Gmail is better as a result of this. Um, and the Syrian dissidents are better for this being a commercial rather than a philanthropic product, because it's never going to get stale. It's never going to lose support because of its commercial value. Um, the area that we've been most active in lately, and I think the most advanced in, has been how we deal with what I think is probably the best understood challenge for anybody using the internet, which is just the gross decline of civility in conversation. Right? You're all familiar with this. People online are obnoxious, and they seem to be getting more obnoxious by the day. Right? And you know, my concern with this, you know, I'm, I'm upset about the meanness problem. Like, I don't like the meanness problem. But I'm more worried about sectarianism, political strife, and ethnic conflict spilling from the street into the, the internet. Um, and the sort of toxicity online becoming the next wave of sectarian violence. So we started off by talking to a lot of people in you know, places as diverse as Myanmar and Iraq and elsewhere to understand where this was happening already. Um, and what we asked ourselves the question is, can we advance natural language learning? So the ability to measure emotion in language um, by virtue of trying to solve this problem. So what we built was a product called Perspective. Um, where we can, uh, let me back up for a second. So we basically built a training data set, first with a massive amount of annotated data from the New York Times, then Wikipedia, then you know, a plethora of other uh, data sets, and then we crowdsourced more data, asking the question, what language is toxic? Toxicity defined by these comments would likely cause somebody to leave the conversation, and each comment was annotated by uh, roughly, I think, 10 to 12 annotators per comment. Massive training data set, probably the largest uh, toxicity training data set in the entire world. Um, we built a series of machine learning models based on this. Um, uh, the one that we launched was called Perspective, uh, which from a technical perspective is, no pun intended, is an API that any publisher or platform can run their comments through this API and receive a score back 0 to 100 of how similar that comment is to comments that other people have said are toxic. So it's basically a tool to measure toxicity in conversation. So then the question is, what are these publishers and platforms doing with this measurement tool? Um, 
Some of them are basically saying, you know, we're going to use this for moderation. Any comment that is 65 to 100 toxicity, we're going to flag for moderators for review. Anything 0 to 65, we're going to batch approve. Um, and so, you know, the New York Times, for instance, you know, is the first publisher that is starting to turn on more comments. You know, we, we, we literally, for the first time, are starting to see a trend where, as a result of this, publishers are turning comments on as opposed to turning them all off by default, which is like bulk censorship. Um, the second example is we're seeing uh, developers build applications for this where you, the viewer, um, can turn the toxicity volume up or down. So like, let's say you're just in a shitty mood in the morning um, and you don't have much of a like, tolerance for obnoxiousness, you might set the toxicity meter to like 20. But after you've eaten and you feel a little better and maybe you've had a good workout, you sort of bump it up to 65. Um, and so you can dynamically um, impact the tone of the comments that you're seeing. And then we're also seeing an authorship application where it's the equivalent of spell check for obnoxiousness. Um, so imagine with your email um, saying, I, will never I don't ever want to send an email with a toxicity score north of 70 without you checking with me first. Um, so again, this is one, this is one example. Um, uh, but we're also working on additional models uh, because Simply restoring civility to conversation doesn't actually get all the people who fled the conversation to come back. Um, it needs to be civil, but it also needs to be coherent. So there's a substantive argument and there's an emotional argument. So we're also building models around unsubstantiality, where we would return a score of 0 to 100 of how unsubstantial comments are. We're building models around off-topic. We're building models uh, around personal attack. Um, you know, each of these is sort of harder than the, the, than the next, but the goal is to use machine learning to facilitate better conversations and to never have alphabet, jigsaw, Google be the determinants of what you do with that score. Now some of you are saying, isn't this like a scary censorship? Um, and uh, my observation is right now the default position is censorship at scale. Um, this product uh, makes it possible to filter by tone, not by topic. Um, and I would posit that it actually makes it more likely that the obnoxious person's comment um, reaches you because it forces them to write it in a way that matches your um, toxicity threshold. So the era, uh, hopefully the era of asymmetric uh, toxicity in conversation is over and we've leveled the playing field to deny trolls that disproportionate advantage that they have in conversation. Okay, fantastic. Well, I think you'll find that we are both civil and coherent. Let's give it a try. Um, let's collect a couple of questions, may I? Any questions in this room? Sir. Yes, please. And uh, please have it a question brief and introduce yourself too. Uh, thank you very much. That's been very insightful, very prescient presentation. My name is Vasilis, an Onassis visiting scholar here at Columbia. Uh, now, I, I love the epigram that data is a new oil. However, there is a big difference between oil and data in the sense that oil would empower the material capacity of a state, of a regime, and then the regime could invest in you know, military or you know, R&D. Data empowers states with psychography. And psychography, basically, you can map individual preferences, uh, beliefs, and then you can tailor down responses on a societal engineering level. So when that happens for you know, terrorism, we all agree it's a virtuous endeavor. But when that happens for other political ends, then there is a kind of a polarizing debate there. So as a European, I'm wondering how safe should you know, non-US citizens but allies feel about the capacity of Google to pass this you know, an enormous amount of data to US state and support non-terrorism activities, you know, political ends, support political ends other than uh, you know, main security uh, questions. Thank, okay. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for May your I collect one more? Yep. Sir, in the back, yeah. Once again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you had, you basically outlined a proposal that you encourage more cooperation between states when it comes to the cybersecurity. And I'm also wondering that among the topics that you talked about was how the private sector has also its role to play. So how would you see uh, companies such as Google, Alphabet, uh, Apple, uh, Cisco, when, whenever one of them actually faces their own cybersecurity threat, how would they collaborate? Yeah. Because they all have their own proprietary data with that. Thanks. Yeah. No, those, those, are, those are great. Great question. So I'll start with yours, uh, yours first. I think that what's becoming increasingly clear is the companies are, ha have enormous capacity to protect themselves. I'll speak just you know, for, for Alphabet, Google, 
you know, Jigsaw in this case, we, we have incredible capacity to protect ourselves as a company from phishing attacks, from distributed denial of service attacks, from malware and so forth. And what we're finding is we're, we're so effective at it that, that two things happen. One, we have an excess capacity um, that we can share. Um, two, um, we actually uh, aren't seeing as many of the trends in attacks because the capabilities are so strong that in some cases we're not actually, you know, people just aren't even bothering attacking us. Um, so, uh, so, so my view on this is, and what I've really tried to, one, one role that Jigsaw has played within the company is we've looked at what are these core security capabilities that we have uh, that have sort of have a proven track record of protecting us and let's externalize them as free products. So I'll give you another, I'll give you an example of this. We have a product, how many of you are familiar with, with DDoS attacks? Um, so some of you. So for those of you that are not, a DDoS attack is, um, you know, it's basically when a website is overwhelmed with traffic um, uh, coming from infected computers with the aim of knocking that site offline. It's like the digital equivalent of a bunch of mass people showing up and, and with baseball bats and just like shutting down a news organization. Um, and this is a huge problem, but we're quite good at protecting Google uh, from DDoS attacks. So we built a product called Shield. What it literally is is a reverse proxy where any publisher um, or news organization, any human rights organization, any election monitoring organization for free will give them a reverse proxy that will throw Google in front of them, our infrastructure in front of them like a shield. So in order to knock you know, a Ukrainian news organization offline or you know, a human rights organization you know, offline or an election monitoring organization you know, offline, you have to knock Google offline first. And we give this away for free. Um, we have a suite of products we've built called Protect Your Election, which are deployed right now in the French election. They were deployed in the Dutch election, and we piloted it in the Ecuadorian election, um, which for every single site um, that is using Shield uh, to stay online, um, uh, we have a 100% track record so far, so far in, in them not getting knocked offline. And we, we, view, protection, we, we view protection of news as you know, absolutely central to the company's mission of, of connecting people with information. Um, to, to, so that, that's an example of what the private sector companies can do. Um, I still think companies are too reactive uh, in, in terms of this is happening to us, so, you know, how do we sort of, how do we deal with it as it pertains to our platforms? One of the things we tried to do at Jigsaw, we're kind of the proactive arm of the, the company. We deal less with, here's what just happened to Google, how do we deal with it? And instead, we look at the next zeitgeist of what are the big challenges at the nexus between international security and business, and we proactively build products to troubleshoot those. I think the aspiration is that other companies will eventually build, um, build a sort of similar subsidiary or similar company, and that we, in theory, would all identify a set of nefarious cyber tactics that have no good reason to exist in this world, and we all sort of, you know, through digital collective action, um, seek to collectively combat those tactics. Um, to, the, uh, to the first question, um, you know, I think that you know, as, a, as a company, um, I think in, as it pertains to Europe, I think the company would be the first to say that when you think about privacy and security, we haven't always gotten it right. Um, but I also think the, the, the evolution and the trends in this are, are really positive. Um, you know, I think that governments and you know, companies have really learned to work with each other um, in a much more uh, high functioning way. I think there still are some tensions, some healthy, some not. I think the most obvious one is just there's an asymmetry that exists in the sense that, I mean, you think right here in the U.S., um, you, know, uh, you know, the U.S. government, you know, when it sort of pushes for more access to information, they're looking at a problem through a national lens, and they're, you know, making requests of companies who are looking at their information and their data through a global lens. And so there's that friction there, which is why the companies have a responsibility to their users and governments have a responsibility to their citizens. And that is sort of asymmetric. And I think that um, you know, nobody's really cracked this code yet, but I do think the conversations are better today than they were three years ago. Okay, one last question. Women, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Handing you a mic. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ginger Whitesell. Um, you talked about how um, basically this line between the digital worlds and the real world doesn't really exist anymore. And so I'm wondering if you can just touch on the importance of anonymity, am, excuse me, anonymity or not, um, especially with all of this data collection that's happening all the time and all the information that's known about us, and um, and whether or not that importance sort of differs depending on the platform that you're on. 
That's a great question. I think, it, I think it does depend on which platform you're on. I also think context matters a lot, right? You know, there's lots of countries where all of us can agree anonymity is a very valuable thing. Um, but there's also lots of context in other countries where we agree that anonymity is not a, a useful thing. And I think, but I also think that, I don't think you can create a monolithic standard for all platforms, right? I think that, you know, what, what the companies have done is they've created a digital topography for the world, and just like actual topography, different you know terrain has different sets of attributes and different you know rules and different norms that govern this territory versus that territory. And it's no different with you know platforms. So Reddit is like a very different set of rules than you know if you're a Google user or if you're a Facebook user. And there's even sort of nuance differences between all of these. And by the way, they also vary from legal jurisdiction to legal jurisdiction across a specific platform. Um, so it's, uh, it gets a little bit complicated, but I think any effort to make it monolithic is going to give you like a massive migraine. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of philosophical uh, and ethical thinking around this. Um, I think that the, to me the bigger issue, um, I mean yes, the anonymity question is, is an important one, but even if you solve the anonymity question, which to me is, um, you know, to me is sort of a very deliberate decision that somebody's making to be anonymous or not anonymous. Uh, if you think about some of the stuff that I talked about, I, I'm, I'm actually much more worried about um, fake accounts um, that are trying to create a perception that, that are anonymous by virtue of them being fake, because um, you don't know the actual person behind it. And they're so effective that they really, I mean, they, they truly you know, seem like they're looking and playing the part. I think that's going to be a much bigger problem. We're working right now on trying to see if we can determine uh, and stress test, are there consistent signals that indicate this particular account is a state-sponsored account, or this particular part of a conversation that's playing out online has been hacked um, uh, by state-sponsored accounts. It's a big what if um, that we can do that, um, uh, but it's certainly something that we're trying. So I think that there's the anonymity conversation and then there's the manipulation uh, conversation. I think that um, I think we understand the anonymity one pretty well, and I think it will land at different platforms will have different rules and norms, and they'll be impacted by their jurisdiction. I think the less understood and newer problem is the manipulation one. I think we're out of time. Uh, Jared Cohn has kindly agreed to have a bit of a, a session with some students as well, so we've got to let you have time to do that. Uh, please join me in thanking him for this fabulous conversation. Thank you. Thank you.